Welcome to class. Um, we've had a few successful, well, I think several successful Shazam uh, um, labs completed, and uh, it's pretty exciting. It works. The songs are identified. Um, I want to announce that we are actually uh, going to have a competition on Friday of the um, of everyone's uh, Shazam projects, and it'll be based on how well they can perform when there's noise added. Um, we'll give the details of the competition next next lecture, so you guys can all enjoy your labs and learn without this uh, overhead of trying to think about a competition on Friday. But um, I hope many of you will participate, and to make it fun, we're going to give a few points of course credit to the of the competition. So um, I assume you'll be working probably in your par pairs that you do the lab in, and if so, you'll each the winning team will each get 1% uh, of uh, course grade added at the end of the course. If you're in a sized group that's not two, then you'll take the total 2% and divide it among the people in your, in your team. It's just to make it fun. So uh, don't uh, get disappointed if it's not a completely fair competition or whatever. It's just uh, the prize is just for fun, but hopefully we'll have We'll have some fun. So that'll be on Friday during office hours, and we'll give you instructions on how you'll submit your code to uh, compete in that. Okay. I um, hope you enjoyed uh, Sai's lecture last time. I trust that he did a great job, and we'll continue there. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. All right, I just got a battery for my uh, microphone, so let me switch this over. There was a demo that Sai made that uh, he didn't have a chance to show you, so I will start with that. Um, you learned about convolution in discrete time. We're going to talk more about convolution. We're going to also introduce uh, delta functions and talk a little bit about the Fourier transform in the lecture today. Um, but he made this demo to illustrate convolution, and um, let me show it to you. Okay, so this is an image. This image is actually always used for image processing. This is one of the famous ones. Okay, so um, what he, what we're going to do is add noise to this in the form of random numbers. Okay, so now it has noise added. All right, now um, you can, one way to try to make it more visually appealing after the noise has been added is to do a smoothing to get rid of the noise. So um, what he's done here in the code is just produce a simple smoothing pattern. It's just going to average together, uh, it, these numbers represent the, the, uh, the smoothing pattern. So you, you take the weight in the center to be the lar largest, and then you have weights all around. So this represents for each pixel in this image, um, you're going to look at the neighboring pixels and take a weighted average, where you weight the center more heavily than the, than the neighbors. All right, And that will produce a new image. And it's this one, I think. OK. so. Oops. You can see that the noise is kind of reduced. All right. Now, um, what we'll do is we'll look at this again at the end and see if we can um, anticipate uh, what would happen and understand it a little bit better. Okay. But this is one one thing you might do to do some processing of a signal is a local average. Uh, what does this have to do with convolution? Exactly. This is a two-dimensional convolution. In fact, if you look at the code, that's what we call here is conv2. That'll do a two-dimensional convolution. All right. So convolution, as you learned, was the um, it's the um, any process that is linear and time invariant can be represented as a convolution. So you talked about systems and different properties they might have. Think about our processing of this image as a system. We, we take an image as the input. We produce an image as the output. And you could convince yourself that this sort of averaging is both um, linear. How is it linear? Well, if, you, if the image is a function, say, two-dimensional function, linear means that if you take 
two images, okay, take a linear combination of them, scale them and add them, right? And then you do this process, which is our local averaging, right? The result will be the same as if I went and processed each of the photos separately through my averaging, and then I took the linear combination when I was done. It would be the same result. So, th so therefore, the system is linear, this, this uh, processing. Okay, time and variance. Now, we've, we're always talking about one-dimensional signals. That's what we're focusing on in this class, but it applies in higher dimension. So it means that if you shift the signal in time and then apply the system to it, that's the same as applying the system first and then shifting the result. Okay, that's what time and variance means. All right? So, again, you could convince yourself that if I, you took the same image but you moved it to the left or right or up or whatever, and then you ran this process of doing local averaging, it would be the same as had you done the averaging first and then shifted. Okay, so yes, this local averaging is a linear time invariant process. Therefore, it will be represented by a convolution. All right, and um, let's and we will come back to this. And so let's go into. I'm going to spend a while talking about delta functions. Oh, again, I lose my pen this time. It's not in the usual spot. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to introduce a useful function called the continuous time delta function. And this is called the Dirac delta function. All right. Okay, so this will not be a straightforward, um, actually I have a way of typing here. Can you guys read that? Yes? Nice and clear. Okay. So it's not as straightforward as the discrete delta function. All right. Discrete time delta function, which Sai introduced to you last time. We called that the Kronecker. And there it was quite simple. It was that the delta of n was just equal to uh, 1 if n equals 0 and 0 otherwise. All right. And we could, we, we've talked about the indicator function before in your problem sets, and we could have said this is the indicator function on the set of numbers 0 of n. That means it'll be 1 if and only if n is in that set. Okay? So that's very straightforward in discrete time. Um, but delta of t, uh, which, we'll which we'll discuss in a minute, is um, not actually a function. So what we're going to do is we pretend it's a function, and we have some rules to work with it. In particular, we're going to be we're going to be concerned with how it behaves under the integral. Okay, so this is really how we'll define it. We'll say that whatever this delta t is, if you integrate from negative infinity to infinity, of delta t times any function f of t, um, this will equal f of 0 if f is continuous at 0.
Okay, let's look at this a little bit more carefully here and s consider if I want to know the following integral, and this becomes known as the sifting property. that um, the integral from negative infinity to infinity of delta t minus some number, which I'll call cap t, of f of t. So this is just delta t, whatever this, this mysterious function delta t, but now I've shifted it over to cap t, right? All right, if I do this integral, well, we can do a change of variable. We can say, um, let you know, let t equal, let tau equal t minus cap t, and we say that this equals the integral negative infinity to infinity delta tau f of, um, what did I do here? Okay, t plus, tau plus cap t, right? Um, delta, oh, sorry. <laughs> dt. All right, so that's going to equal, now we substitute, this is our new function here, right? And so by the definition of the delta function, this is just going to be f of cap t. Okay, so we represent a delta function with a spike as if it's, as if it's the, in the continuous time, it would just be a 1 at 0, right? But here we put a spike at time 0. It's not defined as just being a 1 at time 0. We'll talk about that in a second. So what we have is that um, if you have a function like this, and you have a delta function at time t, cap t, then the result of multiplying these and taking the integral is that you just get the value of the function here, f at time cap t, is the result of multiplying these things and integrating. Okay, so that's what the sifting property is saying. All right. Um, and that's, of course, only if, in this case, it's if... Um, f is sorry if f of t is continuous at t equals cap t in this case right okay so in other words if if there was a discontinuity right there where the delta function occurred then we don't even bother to define what the result would be it's just not well defined in it for our purposes um, but if it's continuous then then the result is f of cap t so, okay, um, so what is the integral of delta t? What? One. Someone said one. Okay. So it equals one. Okay. So this, this, uh, this function, when you integrate it, it's, it has an area of one. Interesting because it only exists, I mean, we, we think of it as only existing at one point on the line. Okay. So this is very different than... Um, It's very different from, um, say, if we were to look at the indicator function in continuous time. Okay, so that would be the following. Here's t, and the indicator function is just 1 at time 0. It's height 1. Otherwise, it's 0 everywhere else, so I guess I can try to draw like this. It's got a hole right there, right? Okay, so that would be 
maybe a first attempt at making a delta function. And we see this is very different than what we've been talking about. Because what's the integral of this indicator function? It's 0, right? In fact, the energy of this indicator function is 0. So for all purposes, in terms of how we are dealing with signals, this function here is 0. It's 0 everywhere except in an isolated point that has no energy. There's no, so the, the, uh, the error between this and the 0 signal has no energy. Okay, we wouldn't be able to hear the difference, for example, in continuous time. All right. Um, but the delta function is, is very different. All right, so we're going to talk even more about it. OK, so we should think of the delta function like a very short pulse of unit area. So for example, we can think of a, um, we, should, we can think of a rectangle that's very tall. And the width is delta. The height is 1 over delta. OK. So if delta is very small, then this is going to behave much like our, I should say, if cap delta here is very small, then this will behave much like our delta function. Um, so this function here, we can write it's rect t over cap delta over delta, cap delta. Right? OK, so let's define this. Here, let's, let's let this be defined as um, delta with a subscript of cap delta of t. OK, we'll just, this is just for our benefit right now to understand the delta function. So if we define such a thing, what we're saying is that um, this behaves a lot like uh, the delta function. So this function. OK, so to be precise, the following is true. The limit as delta went to 0 of the integral, remember, we're interested in how these things behave under the integral, um, of delta cap delta t f of t. equals um, the integral from negative infinity to, sorry, this just equals f of 0 if f of t is continuous. OK, and why we can draw a picture to see why this is happening. Um, So we have our function. We have um, our approximation of the delta function here. This is this is delta cap delta of t. All right. And if we are going to if if cap delta is small enough because it's continuous, this just looks almost to be a constant. It's basically the constant f at 0. This whole thing is f of t. But over that interval, it's not going to change much because it's continuous. So it's roughly f of 0. Therefore, you're just multiplying this rect by f of 0. Now, we already picked a rect that had unit area. right? So the, the result of multiplying and then integrating is going to be just f of 0. All right. Um,
So it's tempting to say that the limit of, as delta goes to zero, of delta of cap delta of t equals our delta function, the Dirac delta function. This is tempting to say. Some people accidentally say this. It's not at all true because um, the pointwise limit of these delta functions is actually So the pointwise limit would be consider any fixed little t, and you would get a you would get convergence to zero for all t not equal to zero. So in other words, everything at times other than zero would be zero. Now at t equals zero, well you diverge. You'd go to infinity. Fine if you want to define a function on the extended reals, you'd say it's infinity at t equals zero, but the Integral doesn't, shouldn't depend on a single point, on an isolated point. So the integral would still be 0 um, of the entire thing, of this, this limit here. Right? So this limit is not what we're after. In fact, that equals 0, but um, more importantly, We could say infinity at t equals zero. Okay. More importantly, the function does not uh, converge uh, in L two. L two means the energy of the error. So there's there there's no limit where you could say that the as you get as you get delta and delta are smaller, the error is going to zero in energy. That's not true. So there's, so there's no real good way to define this quantity. Okay? Um, but what we do have is uh, a notion of a delta function that we can understand how it behaves under the integral. Now, there is an actual precise way to do this. Um, First of all, why do I keep saying behavior under the integral is so important? Uh, well, remember that we had, um, in continuous time, we, had, we have a convolution sum. And we're going to start talking about a convolution integral. Sorry, in discrete time, we had the sum. We're going to talk about the convolution integral in continuous time. And Really, we're, when we're dealing with signals, we're mostly concerned about what will happen to these signals as they go through some process. And if it's a linear time invariant process, that means they go through. They, that's defined by some integral. Now, this is going to be true for physical systems. If we talk about, let's say, your ear and the process of sound going into your ear, or various things, motion, and so forth, they're all going to have integrals uh, defining how this how the signal gets processed. So, because convolution involves an integral. We really only need to know how our signals behave under the integral to, to have everything be well defined. Um, there, is a, there is a mathematical way of doing this. So we're doing it hand wavy. It's because this isn't a, an analysis class. But um, you can do, so you can be mathematically precise. You would, you would define a different integral. You can have an integral that's over a measure, and this uh, we're used to integrals, Riemann integrals, or um, and we're which are equivalent to integrals of the um, Lebesgue measure, okay, that weights everything on the line equally. But you can define a new measure, and this would be something you deal with in an analysis class, and that measure can have point masses, and so you could then talk about the the delta function in a mathematically precise way. All right, but again, we're not going to worry about it. We're just going to say, all right, with this definition, we can do everything we need to with the delta function and pretend it's a, an ordinary function. But we will want to spend some time making sure we understand the nuances of it. All right. Okay, so. Uh, 
it's convenient to do the following interchange. Uh, if you have something like a delta of t minus cap t times some other function, t, then we can say that equals delta where we, the same thing where we change the argument to cap t. So we can swap that argument. All right. Now, why, could, why should we say that these two things are equal? Is there any way we could verify that these two things are equal? What was that? There we go. Perfect. If they behave the same way under the integral, let's integrate these and see if we get the same thing. Integrate from negative infinity to infinity. And then we'll see why we said these are, these are equal. Because, of course, this dt equals f at cap t, which equals the integral of this thing. The second one we could get by just taking f of cap t which is a constant with respect to the uh, variable of integration. And we would just pull it out front. And we would then just integrate the delta function to be 1. And so there we go. So either one of these integrates to the same thing. So it's convenient just to sometimes swap it out and make this substitution. And it's not going to run into problems for us. OK. Um, I mean, yes, we're looking at it like a constant. I mean, I guess it depends on your context. If you're wondering whether cap t is a variable or a um, constant, I mean, I'm not sure you'd ever have a problem even if cap t was varying. Yeah. OK. Um, another thing, what if we, so we've, we've shifted our delta function, but what about the following. What if I looked at delta of a t? Okay. Delta of a t, what is this thing? Remember, our delta function was um, we have, here's zero. We have a delta function we write as an arrow, right? The time zero. Um, what's delta of a t? Did anything happen to delta? Is it okay? I'll give you a hint. It's a, it's a new delta function. Is it any different than the original one? Is it a what? A taller one? Nice guess. I mean, that's that's good thinking, but it's the opposite. It's a smaller one. Well, I guess it depends on what a is. Could be taller if a is less than one. Okay. So you're right. Yes, it's a it's a delta function of a different height. So let let me uh, write this down in formula, and we'll verify it. So what we mean is this equals it's delta of t, but it's scaled with a 1 over the absolute value of a. Okay. Now, that may look mysterious, but it won't in a minute. Because, um, let's check. So we're saying that this got scaled to be of height 1 over a. All right. So let's check it. Let's just integrate it and see what happens. Okay, integral of delta of a t d t. We should s substitute um, tau equals a t. Right? And what we're going to get is um, that's going to equal the integral of whoops blue. The integral of delta tau, d tau, but then we need to have a 1 over a. And the limits of the integral, if a was positive, then they still go from negative infinity to infinity. If a was negative, they go the uh, opposite way. And that's going to give us an absolute value here. OK, and that equals 1 over a. So what we've got here is that this is where the scaling factor is coming from. And we see that if we integrated this side, we would get the same thing. OK, so this is where the 1 over a is coming from. Now, if we furthermore, I guess to really verify, that wasn't really a good, a good way to check. The, the real way to check would be to say, what is delta at f of t 
dt. And this would be, by the same substitution, 1 over absolute value of a, integral from negative infinity to infinity of delta of tau f of, and I'd replace the t with the tau over a, d tau, and then I would get, now I just have a regular delta function, right? So I would say um, that that's 1 over that f of 0. And that's exactly what it would have been for this delta function here. So these both behave the same way when you multiply by a function and integrate. Okay. Um, is this making sense? I'm going to go through some more examples, but uh, are there some any questions? Okay, here's an example. This will also be a good exercise for just manipulating signals with shifts and scalings and making sure you do them in the right order. So suppose you have, um, let's say you have delta of t minus 3, and I'll plot that here. So delta of t minus 3 looks like this. We've got 3, and we put an arrow. Okay, there's the delta function at time 3. Now suppose we... Um, scale horizontally by factor of 3. Okay, so what I mean by that is we're going to squish it horizontally by a factor of 3. So that means we're now looking at the function delta of, and then what we have is 3t minus 3. So we took our old function and we replaced the argument t with 3t. Whenever you replace the argument t with 3t, you've squished the whole function. All right. So graphically we know it should look something like the following. Here's, let's say here's 0, here's 3, here's 1. Now that we've squished horizontally by a factor of 3, we should get something here. So our delta function should have moved here, but what is it? Did the, did the height change? Well, we can, we'll check, but I'll, I'll give away the answer. Yes, the height did change. It's no longer height 1. It's height 1 third. So you end up with height 1 third. Now, now I'm showing you how we represent delta functions of different magnitudes. Okay, we put a number on them. So if we put a 1 third there, and sometimes you draw the height different also. It's your choice, but usually both. You draw the height different, you put a number on top. All right, so the... Um, so the, the, this one here has an implied 1. It's a unit delta function. Okay. So uh, what that means is that, well, let's check. Why is this true? Well, we just had a, um, sorry, we, we just had a formula that said if we scale delta like this, we get a constant up front. So let's do that here. Let's take our delta function. Um, Delta 3t minus 3 equals delta of 3t minus 1. Okay. Now, forget about the t minus 1 for a minute. We now have a scaling factor of 3. Right? So this scaling factor, um, should, we should say that equals 1 third delta of t minus 1 using our formula. Okay. So there's the 1 third. And I did this partly to... Uh, you know, if, if you need practice, maybe it confused you the order of what's, what's done first in the argument, what's done second. Um, you know, you, and you can practice that on your problem sets and so forth. But it's important to keep, keep that clear, um, that we had to factor out the three if we wanted to use the above formula. Right? Okay. Any questions? Okay. So 
So what we've been talking about integrating from negative infinity to infinity. What if instead we have an integral like integral over some set A of delta of t f of t? How can we figure out what that should be? And uh, the trick is that we can always rewrite this as an integral from negative infinity to infinity of delta of t times an indicator function. Well, f of t times an indicator function over a. What that means is it's just a function that's 1 when you're in the set A and 0 otherwise. And so that's one way of converting an integral that has limits of in, on the uh, integration interval to something that doesn't. And then we could apply our formula. So what would that mean? That would mean that this is just going to equal, so for example, let's say we're integrating from A to B, all right, of delta and I'll, I'll do a shifted delta, t minus cap t, f of t, dt. All right. Um, and what should the answer be in this case? OK, so if your cap t here is in the interval a to b, and let's say it's strictly inside, OK? Then, then what would it be? So it equals f of cap t if t is um, in the interval a to b. Actually, I will, yeah, in the uh, interior of that interval, right? And um, otherwise, what does it equal? Otherwise, it equals 0. Ah, you're right. You're right. Undefined if it's right on the edge. Yes. Um, put a note here. And also, if f happened to be discontinuous. I guess even if you were on the edge, but if f happened to be 0 there and continuous, it would still be defined to be 0. But that's just a technicality. OK, so um, why? I mean, we could have done this by, by first you know, taking the steps would have been to say that equals the integral from negative infinity to infinity, um, delta t minus cap t of f of t and then the indicator function, I'll just, for, I'll just write that as u of um, t minus a mi minus u of t minus b. These are the unit step functions. If you take the difference between the unit step functions, you get something that's 1 between a and b. OK, dt. And now we just, this is our new function, right? This here is our function. And we already have a formula that says, if this is continuous at cap t, then we're fine, right? Of course, now if you're outside of, if cap t is outside of that in, interval, then um, this is going to be 0. It's going to be continuous, and it's going to be 0. So your answer would be 0. But if cap t is in that interval, then this is going to be 1. And then the, this will be continuous. Well, assuming f is continuous, this will just be a uh, continuous function equal to f inside that interval. When you're on the edge, it's discontinuous. You shouldn't try to. Uh, talk about what the uh, integral would be when you multiply it by delta. OK. Um, so I guess we can draw a nice picture. We'd have you have your um, a and b. And so then you've got, um, so the product of those goes like this. And then you have your delta function, which is somewhere here. Uh, hopefully, if it's in the interval, it's just picking out the, the red function, right? OK, which is f of t. OK. So the bottom line here is that 
the delta functions in the interval are all that matter. Okay, just a little more on these crazy delta functions and then maybe we'll see why we even cared to define it in the first place. All right. Okay, so how about this? What is the integral from negative infinity to t of delta t dt? All right, what is this? Uh, I shouldn't have t everywhere, sorry, tau. Delta t, uh, the integral with where the limit is t of delta tau d tau. All right, so what is this? Yes? Okay, it depends actually. It depends on little t. So you want to modify the answer? What would it be? Okay, perfect. So if t, if little t is greater than zero, it's one. Otherwise, it's zero. And we have a name for a function like that: the unit step function. So this uh, equals u of t. Now, of course, the edge. You know, we defined u of t. We we gave it a definition for what it is at t equals zero. Of course, this integral is undefined at t equals zero, but we don't we don't care about those little single point uh, differences. Okay, so this is the unit step function. All right. So what that means is you could say that the derivative of the unit step function is the delta function. Okay. So now this has this gives us a way of talking about uh, derivatives of discontinuities. All right. Um, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, it, there's probably always another way to go about doing whatever you would do with this property, but um, it may be convenient anyway to think of it this way, you know. Okay, so. It turns out you can actually go have a lot of fun with this. You can define a derivative of a delta function. Maybe we'll talk about that at some point. Okay, the second derivative of the unit step um, thing. Um, I won't do it here because I first want to introduce some things about convolution. Then it might make sense why you would have a derivative of a delta function. Okay, so how about this? What is the the energy of a delta function. What's the energy of delta t? What? Oh, very, very good. You didn't want to say one. No. It's not one. It's in, yeah, infinity is what we say, and that's actually kind of by convention because we do not have a way to do derivatives. I'm sorry. We don't have a way to deal with delta functions multiplied by each other. So here we will say that this is infinity. And you might think, well, if the delta function is infinity at time 0, and you're picking it out, OK, and you ignore the discontinuity or whatever, then maybe, you, you know, maybe from the definition of delta, you should get infinity here. But in reality, we just do not have a way of dealing with products of delta functions. Okay? But we, there will, will be other reasons to believe that the energy of a delta function is infinity. And, um, yeah, one one way you might want to believe it is consider the um, the rectangle approximation, right? Uh, 
So if you look back at those short rects that we made, and you look at the energy of these things, they get larger and larger because they're getting taller and you square the height. All right, so the, the, energy of, uh, the energy of what we called delta, cap delta of t, if you go look back at the formula, you'll find that this is exactly equal to 1 over cap delta, which goes to infinity as cap delta goes to 0. Okay, so, um, so that's one way to think about why does the delta function have infinite energy. All right. Okay, but we do have a trick for um, for convolution. So convolution of two delta functions uh, would involve a product, but we actually have a way of handling that. Okay, so now we're all, now we're ready to talk about convolution. All right. Okay, so as you were learned last time, if you let if you have two discrete time signals, x of n uh, and y of n, I'll abbreviate discrete time as dt. Okay, then we had something defined as convolution, which was the convolution of these two signals is a signal uh, discrete time signal as well, and that equals this infinite sum. Okay, now we'll define a continuous time uh, analogy to this. Let x of t and y of t, whoops, not plus, be continuous time signals, then we say that the convolution between x and y is a continuous time signal, and it is simply the integral of x of tau, y of t minus tau. D tau. I probably curled my tau's wrong. Oh well, for consistently c, I will do it like I usually do. Okay. So um, now Psi had a good way of highlighting here what to keep track of, that n, the variable that we will express, the independent variable for the resulting signal is n. And in this sum, that's what n is here. So in other words, for each point, uh, for each point of time in the output signal, you would keep n fixed as a constant, and you would do this infinite sum in order to calculate what the result of the convolution is at a particular point. Okay. okay. Um, in fact, I think he also showed you how you would do the mechanics of going about computing a convolution. You would, for any given uh, uh, time n, you keep n fixed. This becomes, a, y is now flipped around in the variable k that you're summing over. It's flipped around and it's shifted by n. Okay, so you do a flip and shift. This is what people call the flip and shift technique for calculating convolutions, um, and then you multiply the two, and you do a do a sum. Okay, for continuous time, it's the same thing. So you see, capital T here, sorry, little t is the is the independent axis of the result. Right. So for each output, for each time of the resulting signal, you you pick the you fix little t. And y is then flipped and shifted because this integral is with respect to tau, right? So let's think of tau as the variable. Then this is flipped in time and shifted by little t. Then you multiply the two and you integrate. There are actually some many demos of this, and so I'll just pop one open online here, okay? 
many things going on here, but let me try to explain. They're showing two separate, um, two separate convolution calculations. They just happen to be side by side. They have nothing to do with each other. Okay, so let's look at this first one. The red is your x of t, or f in their notation. The g is a little wrecked, but it's the one that's centered at zero. It's this blue thing, but centered at zero is your g. Okay, and they're showing you how you go about and calculate the convolution of f and g, which is the green here. The green is the result of that convolution. Can you guys see the green? No, not very well. Okay, unfortunate choice of color by them. Um, but so I'll kind of outline the, the green goes like this. Yeah, it's a little trapezoid. Okay, so they're showing how do you calculate this with the flip and shift. So G has been flipped while well, it's symmetric, so you didn't need to flip it. And then it's being shifted, and for each shift, we're calculating the, the shift is this vertical green line that goes through the middle that you also can't see very well. That's the shift that uh, is occurring, and it's going through a bunch of different shifts, and for each shift, it's multiplying the f and the g. It's showing that with a, um, with a shading. So they're not even overlapping, so their multiplication is 0. Now it's shaded in. And you integrate the, that result. And that gives you the value of the convolution for that one point in time. Okay. So th by doing this, they would, they would uh, as it's overlapping, see, it starts to overlap right now. And right when it overlaps, the center of g is right here. And that's where the output stops being 0. It's 0, 0, 0, and then it's positive. And then it's back to 0 because they're not overlapping. Okay. Uh, same thing over here, but with different functions. There are also websites where you can draw your own function, and you can then dra do the shifting yourself to cut, so it's not just moving along its, at its own pace. Uh, they're kind of fun to play with. So I, I would have had one on here, but for some reason my uh, um, my, f what was it, Flash? No, my Java plugin was like giving me issues. Okay, so. Um, okay, so. Did you guys learn about LTI systems? Okay, so you recognize that uh, abbreviation. Linear time invariant systems. So you talked about all sorts of properties last time um, of a system. Uh, memoryless, um, stable, um, causal, things like this. And a couple of the properties were linear and time invariant, and we've talked about this a little bit today. So these, we spend particular focus on understanding linear time invariant systems. There's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one is because a lot of systems actually just are linear time invariant or close to it. Okay, there are a lot of, for example, physical systems. The way that sound propagates through a physical system is, for the most part, linear and time invariant. The way light moves uh, is linear time invariant until you get to certain magnitudes where you have nonlinearities. Okay. Now, the, the way, you know, so, so the way physical systems operate um, often have these, these linear time invariant properties. In fact, I would say probably it's most common to find physical systems that have at least time variance. The linearity is not always going to be true. You'll find a lot of nonlinear systems. But then that leads us to our second reason to study linear time invariant systems. Uh, it's the same reason why uh, there are classes on linear algebra, you focus on uh, a particular, what seems to be a, a small subset of all the problems. The reason is because the math goes so, f so much further. We know so much more and it's easier to analyze. Okay, so we know a lot about linear time invariant systems and once they're nonlinear and we, we lose all of these tools, then it becomes a lot harder to really understand them. So you'll find that even when a system is nonlinear, let's say controlling a rocket to fly in space, very nonlinear because once the angles get off, the forces become much stronger. And so it's, uh, it's not, anyway, you, you, when you write down the equations, you don't just get linear equations. But because we understand linear time invariant systems so well, 
uh, people designing these systems will linearize them. They will actually take their nonlinear system and say, well, we're hoping to operate it right around this point. You know, uh, we're, we're hoping to always steer it vertical or something like that. And they'll say, let's look at our equations that are nonlinear, but let's take the Taylor series expansion of them about where we hope to operate and throw out everything except the linear part. Okay? And say, as long as we stay close to where we're trying to keep things, then it's roughly linear. And the reason you want to do that is because then you all of a sudden can use all of these great tools we're going to learn in this class that are for linear time invariant systems. So there's sort of two reasons why we go down this avenue, okay, focusing on linear time invariant systems. Um, and then you're not a, the system might not always be something physical. I mean, you might just simply want to design signal processing. You could do it however you want. It doesn't have to be linear or time invariant. But then for the same reason uh, that we just talked about, you might want to stick with linear time invariant systems, at least to begin with, because you'll know so much about them that it'll help you design what you want. And of course, then, if, it, if you can't do what you want with a linear time invariant system, then you have to go try other things where the theory is less developed. OK. So we know that the behavior oops, of an LTI system, which we'll call H, is completely specified by the um, impulse response. So. so we'll call that H of T. So let's say it's a continuous time system. If it's LTI, then its behavior is completely defined by H of t so that we can calculate what the result of this system is on an input signal. I'll use the square brackets here. X of, X of t, we know that it's just going to be the convolution of X and H of t. Okay, so that's pretty cool that, you know, if you have a system that's not LTI and you don't know anything about its properties, then it may not be easy to summarize how the system behaves for every possible input. Think of like a computer program. That's a system. And knowing how it's going to behave for every possible input is very difficult to uh, state. All right? But for an LTI system, you just need to state this one function, h of t, and all of a sudden we know how it's going to behave for any input. It's going to do a convolution. All right? So in block diagrams, we might draw this the following way. Say if x of t comes in, and we have this block, this LTI block, which is capital H, then what comes out here is x convolved with H of t. All right, sometimes we'll even represent it the, with the following block diagram. And instead of h, we'll just say this is convolution with little h. Okay, so that means to us that it's an LTI system, and it has h as its impulse response. All right. What happens in this case? You have delta come in to an LTI system H. What comes out? So you have this mysterious delta s signal. It's not even a well defined function, but I'm going to now pretend it's an actual signal that goes into your system, what's going to come out? Yes? Oh, I saw two, two hands go up in exactly a line from me. <laughs> go ahead. You can go, go ahead in front. Oh, or, yeah. 
Okay. So you're saying HOT, is that what you were going to say? Okay. So um, you said H of T. You jumped all the way to the conclusion. I was hoping you would just say delta convolved with H of T. But you're right, by the way. Yes. So um, by definition, delta convolved with H is going to come out. But you were so quick, you already knew that that was just going to be H. But let's check. For those of you that didn't know that that was going to be H, let's, um, or maybe you said it was H because that's what the impulse response meant to you, is H. <laughs> okay. Either way is a good, good reason to conclude that it's H. Okay. So bec by the above statement, see, delta convolved with H should come out, right? Let's do that calculation. So what's that going to equal? That's going to equal the integral from negative infinity to infinity of delta of t, h of, uh, sorry, delta tau, h of t minus tau, right? d tau. Now remember, we always have to pay attention to which variable we're integrating with respect to. We're integrating with respect to tau, right? So this is a delta function, so we should get this thing evaluated at tau equals zero. So that's going to be equal to h of t. Right? We just put a 0 in for tau. That makes sense to everyone? We just did a convolution with a delta function. And we saw how easy the result was because delta function is so easy to integrate. So delta convolves with h is just h. Delta convolves with anything is just that thing. It's the identity function for a convolution. Right? If you convolve with a delta, you get back the thing you started with. All right? So. So there we go. We've, we've derived that the output should be h of t, what we were calling the impulse response. And in fact, this motivates our naming, right? This motivates us the impulse response. Okay, because delta of t you can think of as, a, as being tapped at time zero. You know, it's an impulse. It's some blip at time zero. It's a blip that has, that, that doesn't, it's, it's not meaningless. It's integral is non-zero, okay? But it happens in a super short time frame. And you, so, you know, you have some, your system is some box, and you, the input is like how you put pressure on the side of the box, and then it gives an output. Then you, if you tap it with a mallet, then that's, you're going to produce the impulse response at the output, right? Okay, and here we've just seen that. Okay, so So here's a common abusive notation, which we are also going to utilize, um, that um, often people will write x convolved with y of t uh, as x of t convolved with y of t. OK, so there's a reason this is convenient. And that is that um, we can very concisely write convolutions of manipulated signals. So I'll give you an example. Example is we could write x of t minus cap t convolved with y of 3t. And it's pretty clear what we mean that um, you, take y, you take x and you shift it by time cap t, and that's a signal. And you convolve that signal with y shrunk by a factor of 3. Okay, 
So that's what we mean by this. Um, so the, the long way to write this, if you wanted to not use this abusive notation, without this notation, we would say something like, we would define an x2 of t, which equals x of t minus cap t. And we would define uh, y2 of t, which equals y of 3t. And then we would say, let's convolve x2 and y2 of t. Okay, It just takes more writing. But let's also talk about why this will sometimes be confusing. Okay, um, and it's really because this notation makes it seem like um, it makes it seem like convolution operates on uh, uh, on x evaluated at some point t and y evaluated at some point t, which would just be two numbers, right? And it looks like this is some operation on two numbers. Convolution is not an operation on x only at time t and y only at time t. If you look at the integral or the sum, convolution looks at the entire length of both signals and uses the entire length of both signals to calculate any one point t, right? So it can be, re it can be really confusing to look at this because you, if you're not used to it, you'll say, oh, okay, I just need to know what little t is and I can figure out just by looking at x at little t and y at little t, I'll figure out what the result of this convolution is. No, that's not true at all. This notation then becomes better for that. X and Y are functions. They're signals. And so the operation is on the entire signal. Um, another reason why this can be confusing is that wh which variable are we using as the independent variable for co convolving? By convention, it's going to be T for us, little t, right? But if, I, if you weren't familiar with that, you'd look at this and say, are we convolving? Is capital T the variable we're convolving over? All right, so there are certain things that we're just going to be used to because we always write them a certain way. Um, and so this notation is going to be convenient because we'd rather not be, not have to go out and write such a simple thing here uh, using multiple lines. All right. Okay. So let me. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just, let me put something here. All right. Let's verify. I'll I'll fill this in later here reason it's confusing. <laughs> okay. Let's verify continuous time convolution. And we'll do it. It's just like you did last time in the lecture for discrete time. But just as a refresher, we want to know what is the output of H operating on X of T. Okay. So, uh, and we know H is LTI. Right. We know it has an impulse response and so forth. Okay, then this is going to be um, H operating on, now I'm going to rewrite X of T. X of T can be rewritten the following way. X of, whoops, ta, tau. Sorry. Say delta of tau minus T, X of tau d tau. Okay, the inside, the argument here, we just used our formula for the delta function in reverse, right? We know that this thing in here should be uh, equal to x of t by the sifting property. All right, so um, if you like, if you think back to how, you def how we derived convolution for discrete time in your previous lecture, um, you separated out your input signal into a sum of a bunch of delta functions. Okay, and then you said, I know what the system's going to do to each of these. We're doing the same thing, but now it's an integral. So it's like you have infinitely many little delta functions added together. Okay, you can think of that we've decomposed our signal in this way. All right, so let me just rewrite. Um, the first thing I'll do is rewrite it like this. Um, X of, let's make it delta of T minus tau, X of tau. All right. Now, why can I do that? Well, because I know that if I multiply by a negative 1 in the argument, I have a rule for what 
time scaling does to a delta function, I would just divide by the absolute value of what I scaled it. The absolute value of negative 1 is 1. Okay, so this is equal. All right, so then that's going to be, now by linearity, since our system is linear and an integral is like a sum, then we can move the operation of the system inside the integral. And, and also by linearity, the system is operating on signals with respect to time t. Tau, this integral is over tau. Tau is just is irrelevant to the system. It's just a constant to the system. So x of tau comes out here, and we get h of delta of t minus tau. So now we've moved this system inside because it's linear. right? So this is linearity. All right, and then um, last thing we have that because it's time invariant, this has to be um, some h of t minus tau. It's just a time sk shift of whatever would have come out from the delta. Okay, so this is time invariance. Okay, now an important comment for convolution here is that Convolution commutes. Since we're short on time, I will show, I will verify that it commutes later. But what I mean is this x convolved with y equals y convolved with x. Okay, and we'll verify that from the equations. So that gives us a cool way of thinking about signals and systems, how they interact. If x of t went into a system that convolved um, with uh, h of t, right? that's equivalent to if you had your signal be h of t, and you have a system whose impulse response is x of t. Okay, These are equivalent. So there's sort of an interchange between what's the input and what's the impulse response. It really didn't matter. The output would be the same. All right, and the last thing, um, I want to just give you a, a flavor for what we'll start with next time since we're short on time. And that is just an example of convolution and how, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say what we'll do, but then we'll do it next time. You, you were told that convolution went hand in hand with the Fourier transform. Okay. It's our big it's our next big secret about the Fourier transform. We started off by saying, well, there are many transforms and Fourier transform is one of one such orthonormal transform. But now but then what you were told previously and what we'll explore more next time is that convolution is multiplication of the Fourier transforms. Okay, it's multiplication in the frequency domain. Multiplication is very easy to understand, whereas convolution is somewhat confusing to understand. Um, so that's, the, that's one of the big reasons why we use the Fourier transform. And what we'll look at is we'll go back to this example where we did the smoothing. And we'll talk about, uh, we'll look at the Fourier transform of an averaging process. And that'll help us understand in another way what this averaging did. Okay. And we'll see that actually it removed high frequencies. So this, this averaging that smoothed out this, this picture actually um, removed uh, some high frequency information from the noise corrupted image. So we'll look at that next time. Oh, one thing about the midterm. Uh, midterm is in class next Thursday. And um, you won't bring any notes or books or anything, no electronics. But we will give you a sheet of formulas so you don't have to just memorize the formulas that you use over and over. Um, I put that sheet on Piazza so you can look at it if you want. We'll bring it printed out. But I want you to know that um, just because something's not on the sheet doesn't mean that you should not think about it for the midterm. Some things that you learn don't need a formula and don't, they should just be remembered you know, because you've practiced with them. So don't use it necessarily as a guide of what the content of the midterm is going to be.